Three summers ago, I was at this point in my life of feeling incredibly fried. One of my friends described me as being soul-weary. I had separated from my husband of 27 years, Rob, just six months before this time. My home had been sold, and all of our stuff had been separated into his, mine, and what were we thinking when we got that in the first place? I had finished uh, my first unit of clinical pastoral education at St. Mary's Hospital in Kitchener. I was working a high-stress job full-time still. And man, I was just burnt out. I was, I was done. And so in the midst of all of this, even church wasn't feeling like a very safe place for me. During the separation, in the lack of information sharing, people decided to make up their own reasons for this. And somehow I got painted in a bad light in almost every scenario. It was great. So knowing that I was moving to Hamilton for my spiritual care residency there, I decided to give myself the gift of time. I packed up the mom van and decided I need a vacation. So in went all my camping stuff after I had done a bit of uh, yard sailing, and off I went. I headed uh, east because my family's originally from the east coast, and I've always found water to be kind of a healing theme in my life. And so off I went, pitched in different spots, and ultimately made my way through uh, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and then up through the Gaspé Peninsula. And this was my view. Oh, oh, not that. That's beautiful, but that's on every PowerPoint screen. And this was my, my view. It was a time of staring at the water for weeks. Every campsite had to be near water, and I ended up at Per Se, Quebec, staring out at this. This was 4.30 in the morning. I snapped that picture one morning. And God spoke to me there. He spoke about all of the wearing away that life happens. You know, without all the wind and the rain and the waves, that's just a big rock. But for me, the beauty came in that situation, in that rock, because of all the, if you will, difficult times that the rock has gone through. And so inch by inch, I slept and I ate, I sat, I slept some more. I I was really tired. I prayed, I'd taken along good friends um, in my books. Um, So, you know, I was reading Henry Nowen and Richard Rohr. And inch by inch, kind of coming back to myself as God spoke there. So then fast forward to last summer. I realized that working at the hospice, I was starting to get a little bit cranky, actually. You know, you, you go along, you think you're doing really well, but after, you know, 300 deaths in a year, that, that accumulated death impact really does start to impact you. And I was finding, I don't want to go to work. <laughs> So I thought, oh, it's time for another camping trip, right? This is the logical conclusion. It was such a healing time the first time around. So one of my coworkers suggested, go to Vermont. There's this great green mountains. There's no bugs. And I thought, okay, sold. Sold in June. There's no bugs. Yeah, I'll believe this when I see it. Well, it actually was true. There were no bugs. But what I wasn't really prepared for was the rain, right? Back in June, you remember... It poured every day. And on a mountain in Vermont, there's not a whole lot to do. So I had taken my my tent and, you know, my stack of books and my journal again, hoping for a mountaintop experience this time, since God tends to speak to me in those kind of metaphors. Off I went. And it was a beautiful sight. The view of the mountains was very nice, what you could see from the the new growth that had sprouted up there. And there was a lean-to, which was great. She had told me, you don't even need to take a tent. But somehow, you know, being inside of that thin piece of plastic made me feel safe from the bears. After all, they probably couldn't smell me through the, the thin sheet of plastic, right? So four days went by. I read everything I felt like reading. I journaled all I felt like doing. And, and then what do you do? Right? So I just was staring at the pile of logs that I wish was a campfire, but the rain wasn't going to let me have that. And as I sat there, God started bringing to memory some stories, stories of grace and mercy in my life that had brought me so far 
in life, right, that brought me to this point, and that's kind of where I want to go this morning. Grace and mercy, mercy and grace. We see mercy and grace stories throughout our Bible, so it was really tough to narrow it down to one, but this morning I want to look at the story of Joseph. Just uh, before we get to the actual scripture, we'll just do a two-minute what happened in Joseph's story up to this point. So Joseph was a favorite son of Jacob, the patriarch, right? He was Rachel's son, this long-waited, hoped-for son. So, you know, you have ten kids, but then the apple of your eye comes along and, you know, does what, Jacob does what every parent should never do, right? He picks a favorite, and, and Joseph is the favorite. And here's this beautiful coat, my son, and then Joseph gets a little bit full of himself, right? He starts having dreams and telling his brothers, which is probably the the really dumb part of this whole story, tells his brothers, I had a dream, and in my dream, the sun and the moon and the stars all bowed down to me. Well, as the oldest child in my family, I kind of relate to the anger that the brothers felt. And so they concocted a plan. Oh, tending the sheep one day, they found a pit and they stuck him in it. Now, very uncreative, these boys. Let's stick him in a pit, and then, hmm, what do we do now? Should we kill him? Oh, maybe we should sell him, because then we'll have some pocket change, since Dad never seems to give us any. So then off Joseph goes, sold into Egypt as a slave. And the boys were left to dip his coat into some blood and make up good stories about him. So Joseph lands in Egypt, keeps his high morals as he flees from Potiphar's wife. You guys all remember this, I'm sure. Lands in a dungeon, dreams some more dreams. And eventually, thanks to a butler and a baker, not a candlestick maker, I always want to say that part, he gets out and rises to the top of Pharaoh's administration as he interprets Pharaoh's dreams of feast and famine with the skinny cows and the fat cows and the skinny stalks and the fat stalks. So... So he comes up with all the right answers and gets promoted. So then when the brothers come knocking at the door, knock, 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 hey, you got any food? He he, he recognizes them now. He's grown up, right? So they don't recognize him, which is always astonishing to me that you could live with somebody for that long and not recognize them, but we'll go with that. He gives them food, and then he packs their money back in the in the bags and he he does this whole trickery thing where in the end he ends up saying okay well you can only have more food if you bring benjamin back with you he wants to check on his little brother also from rachel make sure that they haven't offed him as well so they do this they go away for as long as they can until they're really starving and then they break it to their dad you know he's only going to give us more food if we bring benjamin with us and his father basically breaks out the sackcloth and ashes. How can you do this to me? You've taken one son. You're taking my other son. I'm never going to see you again. But eventually, off they go. And this time with Benjamin, as they're sending him back, he hides the silver cup in his luggage and then keeps Benjamin. And this is going to break their father's heart. Now, if I'd been Joseph, this might have ended pretty differently. I might have been looking for a little revenge, just maybe, thinking. But Joseph did it this way. So let's, it's time for the big reveal now, you know. Uh, Here are the drum rolls in the background as we read this. So Genesis 45, verse 1. Joseph was no longer able to control himself before all his attendants, so he cried out, Make everyone go out from my presence. No one remained with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. He wept loudly. The Egyptians heard it, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? His brothers couldn't answer because they were dumbfounded before him. I bet. Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. So they came near. I bet you could have heard a pin drop with that news. Imagine that you're one of the brothers. What are you thinking is going to happen next? Whatever it is, I bet you don't think it's a good thing. Then he said, I'm Joseph, your brother, whom you have sold into Egypt. Now do not be upset and do not be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me ahead of you to preserve life. 
For these past two years, there's been famine in the land, and for five more years, there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me ahead of you to preserve you on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it's not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me an advisor to Pharaoh, lord over all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now go up to my father quickly and tell him, this is what your son Joseph said. God has made me lord over all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You will live in the land of Goshen. You will be near me. You, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and everything you have. I will provide you with food there because there will be five more years of famine. Otherwise, you would become poor, you, your household, and everyone who belongs to you. Brother Benjamin can certainly see with your own eyes that I am really the one who speaks to you. So tell my father about all my honor in Egypt and about everything you have seen, but bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw himself on the neck of his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Joseph showed mercy to those boys, those now grown into men boys. He gives them food. He invites them to come and live with him. And as the second most important person in the land of Egypt, Joseph held that power of life and death in his hands. But he chose not to use it, but do something different. Right? Instead, of he withheld punishment, mercy, and he gave them gifts, grace. I bet his brothers had a hard time believing that good news. I certainly would have in hit their, their case. Now, I've got three kids. Um, they're terrific kids. They're all grown up now, Andrew, Dan, and Heather. When they were younger, though, they will tell you with one voice that I was probably like the meanest mother in the entire world. I'm just saying, really mean mom. I used to actually make them help around the house. It's, it's true. I won't deny it. This fall, I got a chance to visit with Heather. She's living in Newfoundland now in St. John's, and we were traveling across the province uh, on our way to Gross Moor National Park. And Great Big Sea came on the radio with one of those, you know, donkey riding or, or something really um, East Coasty. And she stopped me and said, Mom, do you remember when you used to make us, you used to put this music on and we used to have to clean for 15 minutes? You set the timer and we had to clean to this music. I said, Yes, I remember it well. Anyway, one night after dinner, when Heather and Dan, my two youngest, were, I don't know, probably eight and ten years old, um, it was time to do the dishes, and it was Heather and Dan's turn, because the rule in our family was, if I had to cook, somebody else had to do the dishes. Well, the two of them started after dinner, they started arguing, now it's your turn to do the dishes, I washed last time, you have to dry, right? And this went on and on and on, and finally, ten minutes in, they had, they had taken it into another room, ten minutes in, I decided, okay, we're into teachable moments, this could be a great teachable moment for them. I got up and quietly as a mouse did the dishes for them, and then, you know, ten minutes later, they were still at it. I marched them back in, I brought them in, and I showed them the dishes. Look, guys, I have done the dishes for you. So let me explain to you the difference between mercy and grace. I said, grace is you got the dishes done for you. This was something you did not deserve. This was a gift to you. And the mercy part is that you're not getting what you do deserve. <laughs> and we're going to go with a time out. I'll just, you know, that, that's uh, the appropriate thing to say, right? That's what you didn't get. You didn't get the time out. Now, I'm sure they have forgotten that little teachable moment, but it went deep in me, so I learned about grace and mercy if nobody else did. And a couple of years later, my oldest son, Andrew, uh, was being bullied by one of the tough boys on our street. Andrew had to walk by his house every day, and they, him and his, his little gang of hoodlums uh, would follow him home and taunt him. You know, it was a tough time. And Rob, my now ex-husband, was having anxiety attacks because this was like totally throwing him for a loop because he didn't know what to do. He lost 20 pounds in two weeks because of his worry and, and just couldn't really function very well. So this boy, Mark, had gathered this gang around him, and we all know there's lots of bravery in numbers, right? 
it was pretty awful. And then, you know, one day I was driving by Mark on the street, and just for a second, like really, just for a second, really, Mama Bear rose up in me and said, you know, keep, if you just lost control, just for a second, nobody, nobody would know. <laughs> It would be the end of Andrew's problems, might be the beginning of my problems. And so the, the voice of the Holy Spirit, you know, the voice of reason in this case, won out. So I didn't, like, run anybody over. But just for, for that second, entertained the thought. Then Mark and his gang decided that our basketball net at the end of our driveway was the new place to hang out. So they were coming closer and closer. And it just felt like, you know, it was, it was a tough time. Home didn't feel safe anymore. And then I started to hear the doorbell going off about 3 in the morning every night. So I thought, okay, well, I'm up. I checked the door. There's nobody there. I guess it must be time to pray. Imagine, right? Your family's in chaos. It's time to pray now. It's amazing how clear you can hear God's voice at 3 in the morning with no distractions and maybe the, the wish to get back to bed at some point. And there I got an answer. Bake them cookies. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not my first inclination, right? Bake them cookies. But as I sat with it, I thought, you know, if that's not a Jesus thing, I don't know quite what is because it's totally counterintuitive to everything I want to have happen here. So... So the next time they rode at the basketball net, I brought out my plate of chocolate chip and some lemonade and introduced myself and asked what their names were. There were about eight of them. I got six. Hi, I'm Mark. Six. They they all wanted to emulate their hero. Finally, the last two actually gave me their names. They lived across the street, probably figured I already knew who they were anyway. Turned out that Mark hadn't even been there that day. Mark was somewhere else. I let them know that they were welcome to use the net as long as my kids were not out playing. And then I went in, and they continued to shoot some hoops. So what's the power of chocolate chips? That's the real question here. Well, it was kind of beautiful. The bullying stopped. I guess the boys were feeling a little bit guilty, having been on the receiving end of the cookies. Grace, it was gift a gift they surely didn't deserve, and having received mercy that they were unaware of as I failed to run them over with the mom van. So we went on vacation shortly after that, and when we came back, Mark had gone to live with the other parent. Mark's dad's house had a for sale sign on the lawn. And on the way home, just before the cutoff off the highway, this car cut in front of me, just for a second, long enough to read the license plate and zoomed off again. Nobody else saw it, but the license plate said, fear not. I had received God's grace extended to me. My family had received a lot of grace just through some chocolate chips. Now, I was a glutton for punishment in my divinity degree, and I took both Hebrew and Greek, so you're getting double barrels this morning, just for a minute. One of the first lessons that I learned in Hebrew, if you can stick that up there, was that like, uh, you know that TV show, Whose Line Is It Anyway, where the points don't matter? That's the tagline. Well, apparently in Hebrew, the pointings, the vowel pointings don't really matter that much either. It's really about those three letters in the middle of it. Can you flip to my Hebrew? Yep. (laughs) So mercy... Chesed, mercy. You know you're saying it right if everybody in a 10-foot radius is a little bit wet, so I'm probably not saying it quite right. Chesed means mercy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. There's another Hebrew word with the same three letters. Chesed means stork in English. And the story that I've heard, and I can't confirm it, but it's a great story, so why, why ruin it with finding the facts? Is that the stork, when it encounters abandoned birds, right? Their, their mama bird has died or gone off. Other species, it adopts them as their own. What a beautiful picture of mercy. These little birds spared 
and got a gift of life. Grace, in Greek, has a similar kind of story, very shortly here. Charis means grace, goodwill, loving favor, loving kindness or favor. And then charisma is a gift, something we don't earn for ourselves, but is given to us. So in reality, mercy and grace are really two sides of the same thing, undeserved, unearned gifts to us. When God gives us gifts, they're not just meant for us to hold on to, but they're for the benefit of others as well. So cookies made for the neighborhood bully, even though the right guy wasn't there to get them, caused a ripple effect in our neighborhood as others experienced this gift of grace and saw that there was an alternative way of being in the world, right? Mercy is a powerful thing. Sometimes when you need a gift of grace to reorient you to what is right, you get it. And I think Joseph's brothers would have never again dared to pull any of the stunts that they pulled with Joseph after they had experienced that mercy and grace that he showed them later. How could you possibly encounter that kind of kindness, that gift, and not come away a different person? Now, in hospice, I ask this question to a lot of people. So what is it about you that allows you to get through these difficult circumstances? I wanted to ask that to Joseph if he was here this morning. What was it about Joseph that allowed him to extend such grace to his brothers? Was he just simply on a different plane than everybody else in the world? Well, maybe. Was he a better person? Hmm, Who knows? I think it was because he was able to see God's purpose in his own hard circumstances and to see that, as for you, you meant to harm me, but God intended it for a good purpose so that he could preserve the lives of many people, as you can see this day. He saw that God had shown him grace in rescuing him from the pit, bringing him out of prison at just the right time, going to Egypt, elevating him in Pharaoh's house. Certainly Joseph was on the receiving end of grace and mercy. And who among us has not experienced that grace in our lives? I don't think there's a person on the face of the earth that can't say that they've been affected by God's grace and mercy. We all look back over our lives and recognize that we have received many gifts. We woke up this morning, grace. We have food to eat, grace. We live in a country with health care. Grace. We're not hit by a lightning bolt when we get out of bed, when we've not lived up to God's standards of holiness. But instead, God offers us love, acceptance, and forgiveness, mercy, and grace. And since God has extended mercy and grace to us, we're able to do the same, extending it to others. Sometimes it's the last thing we feel like doing. But then what happens? If we hold on to our being right at the cost of relationships, sometimes we just want to repay evil with evil, don't we? That mama bear thing that goes on. Everything starts to escalate. You do this to me, I'm going to do it twice back bad to you, and and then it just keeps going up and up and up until it's way out of hand and it's a mess. Mercy and grace is totally counterintuitive to our natural way of being. And that's how you know it's a gift from God. There really is this upside-downness element to the kingdom of God, God's dream for the world. When we would use power and might and privilege, God says to us to extend grace and mercy instead. And it gets easier as time goes along. Now, I see a lot of dying people in my work in hospice, many whom have been treated unfairly over time. But rarely do I see anybody that comes to the end of a life who wants to hold on to their anger and bitterness towards others. Instead, what do they want? They want reconciliation. They want to be the first ones to lay down their agenda and say, I was wrong, please forgive me, or you wronged me, and I forgive you. One final story this morning. There's this 80-year-old woman that I had the great privilege and honor to accompany at hospice for about two years. We're going to call her Evelyn. That's not her name, but 
but we'll call her Evelyn. She had a really tough life. She lost her mother when she was five years old, a brother when she was just little who ate glass that was broken. Her father remarried her aunt who came to live with them to to help get them through back in the eastern hills of Ontario. And she never really got over this trauma. She was largely illiterate, had an anxiety disorder, couldn't go out without passing out a lot of times. She hated crowds, but somehow, when she was 18, she got the gumption up to leave the eastern hills and went to Ottawa, where she got married and had a family, which surprises me no end. She was angry all of her life, suspicious of people and their motives to her. Now, her own family, she had three kids, but she didn't really have much to do with them. In fact, in all of our talks, you know, she had grandchildren, but three of them, she didn't even, couldn't tell me their names. Like, she, it was that out of sync. Evelyn was not the sweet little old lady down the road. No way. She was cranky. When I met her, she was one of the first people that I came to know through the hospice. And I visited with her every couple of weeks uh, for social interaction mostly and to explore her fears around dying as she had cancer. When I called her feisty instead of cranky, her eyes lit up because she felt like, oh, somebody finally gets me. As her illness progressed, she became more and more afraid of dying. We talked about her ideas of who God is and isn't. And she settled in the, into this idea that she wasn't going to die at all. And so even though she was frail and very, very ill, she fought. She fought even through a broken hip that landed her in the hospital for three months recovering. She fought. And so for for about two years, she was actually pretty stable. And then I got a phone call one morning about 11 o'clock. Her family called to say, you know, sometime this morning, she actually made her way down the stairs to the basement to feed her cat, uh, who was probably the real love of her life, the only only critter that loved her back out of her, her family there. She had managed to uh, start breakfast, and as was her custom, she had oatmeal every morning with brown sugar, and she had her hammer out because she was a bit of a tightwad to boot, so she she had a big chunk of brown sugar, and she kept the hammer on the counter to smash the brown sugar every morning to get it into the oatmeal. So she'd gotten that far, but she hadn't actually eaten the oatmeal, so her family had known that she was up, but she had gone back to bed and was now unresponsive. So I came to support the family. And when I, when I came in, they were all in the living room while she was in the bedroom by herself with the cat, her only real joy at her feet. So when I came, I crawled up into bed with her and I told her her stories again about how when she was a little girl, the traumas that she had endured and how much I admired her for her strength to leave the farm, to venture out into the big world with her anxiety disorder, And how strong she was. She was a strong woman at the end of the day. She died that night. She had been a gift to me. Now, she received a gift too. A gift of accompaniment, of care, of having someone to listen to her stories and fear. But I got that gift too. And that's what grace is really like. It goes two ways. I got to witness a life that was difficult but not without joy. I was inspired by her courage to make change, scary changes, even with that anxiety disorder. This week, I want to challenge you. Take a look back over your own life. Where have you experienced God's mercy, God's grace? And then look ahead. Are there ways you can extend God's mercy and grace to those in your life? It's really great to practice with little things like cookies. Um, You know, like all spiritual practices, they're kind of like working muscles, right? The more you do them, even the little repetitions, like working with weights, it gets a lot easier the more you do until you can lift things on your own without even having to think about them. That impulse to do what's right gets stronger. Certainly for me, teaching my kids about the difference between mercy and grace through doing those dishes 20 years ago now, baking cookies for the neighborhood bullies, 
and many other times, you know, that I've been on the receiving end or the giving end of, of extending mercy and grace prepares you for the big things that come along. So when your 27-year marriage falters and fails, when people take sides against you, when you hear you have a palliative illness, when you know any number of things happen in your life, you will be able to treat others with mercy and grace around you. One final thought. Anne Lamont wrote this. She says, I do not understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are and does not leave us where it found us.